She was born in Costa Rica, immigrated to the U.S. as a 27-year-old. She's uh, always been a writer, uh, not, not just a technologist. Um, <laughs> and she lives part-time in San Francisco and part-time in Costa Rica. She has a dog, though she has not yet provided their name. <laughs> uh, she loves to dance as individual art, but can't draw. Um, is autistic and tempor- temporarily really into birds. And I am also those things. So. That's great. <laughs> That's Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, first tell me your dog's name, and then we'll ask the real questions. His name is Dante. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay, I guess we got we got lots of background, but um, if you had a political journey, like what do you identify now, and how'd you get here? If there's <laughs> any tales to tell. Yeah, well, I grew up in a leftist household here in Central America in the '80s. We had war. We had, you know, anti-communist persecution and a lot of other stuff. Uh, I grew up in that environment. I grew up around people who were fleeing the dictatorships in Latin America and came sometimes as refugees, right? So uh, yeah, it was a very, I would say, socialist slash communist household. Um, I, uh, yeah, pretty, you know, not not super mainstream in the country, but uh, but not unique at all. There was a strong left in Central America at the time, and then I, you know, went to school, did other things, uh, realized that maybe like the traditional left wasn't for me. I, you know, had been reading Bakunin, Malatesta, Goldman, all the all the serious things, and I remember a university professor. I had a philosophy professor was totally fascist, um, accused me of being an anarcho-syndicalist. And I'm like, I'm going to have to write that down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you, Fash professor, because, yeah, um, so. yeah then I, um, you know, look for other things. And, you know, over time, I stopped reading theory because it's a little boring for me. I got more into arts and social sciences. So, you know, now I'm more influenced by David Graver and like the stories of yours like Kaylee Wren and like beautiful futures that we find more in, in literature. Yeah, theory has always been a little dense for me. Um, <laughs> did uh, anyone in particular influence you besides your um, ter- terrible professor? Um, well, there was a small anarchist collective here when I was growing up, and they were friends with my parents, and I thought they were funny and a bit of a mess. Uh, but I always thought, oh, there's, you know, anarchism. There's this other thing that has uh, an alternative to state and authority and power and all that stuff. So I think that was also a an influence. So if somebody asked you real quick, what what are you politically like what what's your do you have a one would, word two, two words? <laughs> yeah i'm a small a anarchist right i'm like i believe about finding freedom you know in the corners of our lives and doing more than you know like dreaming or thinking of a larger future um I know you, you, you've touched on um, being uh, particularly anti-fascist. Has that affected any of the work you do? I think so, but um, I think it's it's a bit abstract, right? Like when you're an anti-fascist, you're looking out for you know, how power and oppression you know, shape our lives and the lives of our communities. And you're always trying to fight that and take action. And that, that I think is the way in which my my life is influenced by anti-fascism. Um, well, you have so many different careers, so I'm trying to decide what we should talk about first. Um, I had to look up uh, open source communities, um, and it says you studied the emergence of open source communities in Latin America. Um, 
can you can you talk about that kind of sure yeah what, what that means even of course yeah i have a very long life so i've done a lot of jobs um in one of them was a million years ago in 2006 i was um working with a local nonprofit here in central america and they um the Canadian government hired me to do a social research on the emergence of open source communities in in different Latin American countries. And open source is, is software that is um, developed collaboratively and that the source code for the software is available um, to use for other people, depending on the license that varies. But in general, that's the idea. You get together with a bunch of people and develop software together. And those communities were starting to form in Latin America. And I was interested in, like, why did people do that? Why did they, what were their, like, their political motivations? What were their personal motivations, economic, all that kind of stuff. So that was really fun. I wrote a book. <laughs> um what what do you what is great about open source like what is... ah, there's plenty that's great and plenty that is not right okay. I, uh, <laughs> I think, you know everything um i think what's great is it is one of those few opportunities to build something with a group of people a collective project that you all need those opportunities, I think, in the world are rare, and software lets you do that, and open source specifically lets you collaborate with other people that maybe you don't know, or very different, different language. Um, so, yeah, sometimes that can be pretty good. Um, and I guess that brings to the question, um, which is a huge topic, but intellectual property, um, <laughs> how you feel about that? like? I feel bad about it. I'm terribly against it. Yeah. And why? Some people, you know. Yeah, I know. It's a it's an it's an important subject because, you know, like artists and creators and like all kinds everyone in the world deserves to live a decent life and be hopefully common in this hell world of capitalism, be compensated for their labor, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one thing is that, that labor and the other is like the product and who owns that product. Um, so it's a complicated subject and I'm not an expert. I have coworkers who are like geniuses and know all about it. All I know is there has to be a way in which we can use each other knowledge without always having to ask for permission and always have to pay a corporation an enormous amount of money for their license, right? Um, we have to innovate and find ways to give each other the resources we need to live without, you know, holding ourselves to these weird laws and licenses that end up um, not working for us anyway. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot, um, so many small artists, like um, on, on Blue Sky, uh, the, the new Twitter, maybe, um, I've seen Mike Masnick cla uh, clashing with a lot of small creators about his stance on intellectual property. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of um, people getting very nervous about AI just for that reason, even. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't know if there's anything... If there's anything, like, to assuage their worries at all, except... <laughs> I think their worries are justified, but not because AI is, is going to replace them. It's because corporations are going to replace them with AIs. You know, like it's not, yeah. the problem is not the AI. The problem is people in corporations and media companies and all kinds of places are trying to cut costs and substitute human labor uh, for a cheaper alternative which is going to impoverish us all, right? Like it's it's going to be a poor field. We're going to have live in a boring world where everything looks the same. Uh, but that's the thing. That's I think that's the problem. It's the the need to cut costs and to you know the predatory model 
of capitalism and not so much generative AI, which, you know, I have my problems with. My main problem with it is that it's not good enough. I wish it was, I wish it was better. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people say it's soulless for visual stuff. Um, it It is sort of predictably fancy now i guess i don't know there's like it seems like yeah. there's a very specific look and that's all you get but um yeah it's kind of like a i i always feel like it's i work with artists even at eff i work with the design team very closely and what we always say is like this is this is something that we've already seen right it's something that vaguely we've already seen before it's like a compilation of, of features and colors and patterns we've seen before but what artists do is give you something new something you've never seen something that's completely you know out of their brains and ai can't can't do that right? will it ever be able to i mean that's a that's too big a question but um i don't know i don't think so no <laughs> Um, I think when AI produces an original thought, like the day that happens, we won't be able to recognize it. Yes, I think that's probably true. Um, I, I definitely agree. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you believe in any kind of, I'm just curious about this as someone who writes, um, like a social stigma against copying? You know, if I write A Tale of Two Cities by me, like, and I don't change a thing. Like you, you know, like, or creative commons, like, is there any version of like a gentle intellectual property that you would support? Um, I like creative commons. I think yeah. it, it is a good idea to say I, permissions first, right? Like I want people to able to do this by default and then uh, with certain conditions. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I think it's a good compromise. I, you know, I feel like artists are, um, I think, you know, you're totally empowered to use whatever you want. Like, I'm not, I'm not a cop. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there's so many big, big questions that I could pester you with. Um, <laughs> I guess, are you, okay, here's something more open-ended. Um, are you an optimist about t technology? Um. Ah, it's so hard <laughs> to tell. I'm not. I'm not a techno optimist, as you know, like the VCs tend to be. I don't think tech is going to help significantly fix a lot of the social problems we are seeing now. Um, in fact, I think the problem now is fascism, and tech is only helping. Right? Like it's not not making it better. It's making it worse. But I am an optimist in that I believe that tech can do wonderful things. Like, I love it. That's why I care about it, right? Like, I, I feel AI can be great. I feel a lot of things can be amazing for us. Um, yeah, there's there's other problems that won't let us. But, uh, but the tech is not the problem, right? Like, yes. for me, that's usually not the okay. case. Um. So I came from American libertarian circles where um, the most naive American libertarians used to think every tech guy was swell. Like they used to think <laughs> Peter Thiel was swell. Is there anybody who isn't awful? You know, that sort of person. I don't know. Just like, from that, that uh, cat. Is anyone in Silicon know. Valley not awful, I guess, is the real question. I don't know. Yeah. I yeah. think there's a lot of there's a lot of people who are really into the tech and not thinking too much or too clearly about the consequences or like the social issues attached to them. Um, so I don't think, you know, they're terrible people. They're just not, that's not, they're, I guess, that's not in their, inside their perspective. Right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. It's, there's, there's just so much garbage out there. Um, do you think that 
privacy? Um, is there any future for privacy <laughs> at all? <laughs> yes, I do, because I like refuse privacy nihilism, right? Like mm -hmm. I refuse to give up and say, well, you know, if your phone is tracking you all the time, then what are you going to do? I think that's a terrible attitude, right? Like we have to defend it and we can claw it back. And there's a lot of things that we can still do to demand our privacy to be respected and strengthened. So I believe there's, yeah, I believe there's a future for it. Do people want it enough? I've often thought that maybe the only possible hope is making privacy like a default consumer good. I mean, I know Apple sort of has dabbled in that, but it doesn't seem like enough people demand it um, when they're getting yeah. a shiny new toy, which like, I mean, I understand. Sure. But like, yeah. do people even want it? I guess. Um, I don't know. I think people do want it. They just don't know how, like maybe a lot of people don't know how it could affect them directly when their privacy is not respected or fully violated. Um, and I understand because that's not something you think about every day when you go about, you know, doing your things, doing your job, trying to live your life. Um, but I do agree with you that privacy by default is, is the ideal, right? Because we don't want to have to convince people to care <laughs> about their privacy. Um, hopefully we can convince some companies and some um parts of government and lawmakers that privacy is worth it is worth protecting for many reasons um so tech can be dangerous but um government attempted legislation can be obviously dangerous is there yeah. anything, <laughs> in particular like is there anything that you worry about in terms of future uh legislation that you know is either misguided or just a total bad idea oh yes so right now we have a few uh, a few bills um two or three i think i'm not the expert on this but i um work on this so i hear it all the time uh they are bills you know aimed to protect the children from the evils of online and they of course don't protect children at all they what they do is to restrict a lot of the uh, freedom that we have online to talk about things like mm, about sexuality and gender identity and many other things that we definitely need to discuss. Um, so there's a few bills that are terrible that are um, current and we're trying to shut them down. And then there's always the international effort to weaken encryption, uh, which is particularly worrying. I, governments of the world and international organizations even um, keep trying to weaken encryption and try to get um, corporations to make backdoors so that they can you know protect us from the bad guys um, but though all of those attempts are extremely easy to abuse and we can see how they could be used by repressive governments and just generally bad actors to you know do whatever they want um, do you find that, I mean, thinking of, um, oh my gosh, what's the law that, is it COSA? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. People like, you know, li suppose liberals like Elizabeth Warren types, um, sort of centrist liberals seem very easily fooled by, I mean, some of them seem very nervous about encryption. They're very easily fooled by, by COSA and stuff, even when you have actual politicians say it's like intended to protect children from like trans people i mean yeah. like <laughs> i don't know where to begin with that <laughs> level of naivete i guess um right yeah i think it's it's very hard to come out and say i am against protecting children right like so politicians don't usually love that um there's also the pressure of law enforcement mm -hmm. say, oh, we really need to weaken encryption and weaken protections, right? And then there's also just like, how to say that, uh, uh, the, the, I think the US has this terrible system where 
constituents actually have to call and contact their representatives to, you know, appeal to the amigos sometimes to say, this we really care about this. You should care too. And that incredibly really matters. So if those legislators don't hear about it, they are probably not going to care. Yeah. Um, is there anybody in the U.S. Uh, government that's actually like a friend to good ideas about tech and not a disaster? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a couple, but I'm not an expert on this area. So um, I think my friends at, yeah, at EFF have written more about like what what institutions or what representatives tend to support better initiatives than others. Yeah, I'm just hoping that, I mean, there's some young, horrible people in the U.S. government that when you have literal 80-year-olds trying to pass laws, you know, about Section 230, and mm. and they don't even know what it is. Like, you know they don't even know what it is. And yeah. I, maybe they it can't have... be worse, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, they do work with a lot of people around them who tell them who can tell them what's what. Well, that's that's part of what we try to do is to reach to staffers, reach to like you know the vast apparatus of U.S. government to you know try where we can. Um, I don't have a smooth segue, but I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit about algorithms. Um. Is the internet getting worse, specifically search engines? Um, I, I see a lot of this is totally anecdotal, but people complaining that Google is not what it once was. And Google is aggressively, you know, asking to you, can I use AI for this search, please? Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's something that concerns you. It's going to... I don't know. Yeah, I have a personal opinion about it. Um, I think they are getting worse, um, in part because people have learned how to use their, I have used their algorithms, but also because they insist on, you know, indexing and using AI and using techniques that are not improving their results. They are maybe improving their impression, their ad impressions, you know, yeah. or like um, doing other optimizations, but not really making the content better. I think the content is, I, I mean, at least subjectively, I think it's worse. Is there any hope for that? Um, I assume it'll get worse with AI and maybe someday if Someday it could get better. But, uh. <laughs> I think so. There's very smart people working in search. I cannot believe that they're going to let it completely rot. I, I doubt it. I have so many. I don't know. <laughs> I want to ask you, like, what you do in, like, your tech every day. Like, in, like do you protect your privacy at all? Like, what browser do you use? Like, <laughs> you don't have to reveal all, but like, is there anything yeah. you recommend, especially for someone who? Um, well, I don't, I honestly don't do a whole lot. I have, you know, my partner and other friends are a lot more careful, I, I say paranoid than I am, but, um, but I um, mostly use Firefox. I think it has a pretty good, you know, privacy by default ethos that I like. Um, there's a lot of things that I uh, that are maybe corporate software that I don't that we don't use at work because we have reviewed their privacy policy and it hasn't been good enough uh, for us. So we end up using a lot of open source software and a lot of other less fancy but uh, maybe more uh, privacy friendly options. Um, I do use an Apple phone, pretty normal. Um, and, you know, I use Signal, of course, uh, for basically all of my communications. I don't like, I don't make a distinction. I send little puppy photos and birthday wishes over Signal because I, yeah. you know, that's, that's the thing. Um, and then, I use Tor a lot of the time okay. uh, to surf the web. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, try to protect my privacy as much as it's practical, I would say. Yeah. 
I've actually, I've always almost used Tor, and then there was always vague talk about it, it almost points an arrow at you a little bit that you're just the fact that you use it at all is sort of like a red flag <laughs> to the government. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that's why, for example, that's why I use Signal for everything, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to use it only for your, you know, super international spy activities. <laughs> you want to use it for everything and, you know, try to normalize that we all want anonymity and privacy in our day-to-day -day lives so that, you know, those arrows aren't that pointy. Um, do you think we, both the lay person and an actual tech expert, like, do we know what's going on? Because I often think about, um, it was Julian Sanchez, the tech guy at uh, the Cato Institute. I distinctly remember him saying that Skype seemed secure, like before the Edward Snowden leaks. And obviously that didn't turn out to be the case. And I know the government clashes with Apple. And they all want the back doors, like, and then I just saw a book about, you know, facial recognition software getting very, very mm. good, better than we think. Yeah. I'm alarming myself here, but like, I mean, do we even know sort of like what they're doing, what the NSA is doing in any sense? Like, how do we, do we know what's happening? <laughs> there's a lot we don't know, but yeah. there's a lot we do. So I think... You know, it's this it's not an either or. I think there's a lot we don't know yet. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's, you know, like enormous, I, I personally don't think that there's like, there are enormous conspiracies going on behind the scenes. <laughs> I guess I'm just curious if, you know, if, if tech is ahead of sort of what we think in terms of, um, you know, the spying apparatus, the ability to go through all the data that like, you know, I know sometimes mm -hmm. the problem is the government has too much data to even go through. So like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think that the, there are very powerful tools out there um, that, you know, are always getting better, I think. I'm not that worried about like how good the technology is getting. I'm more worried about, for example, the police um, going over all of their regulations and restrictions to use this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, yeah, police using facial recognition without warrant, all the spy technology that is deployed at street level, right, for just general surveillance, um, ALPRs, uh, license plate readers, and not to mention all the stuff that's in the border, uh, surveilling the border. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a lot out there. It's not all like hidden or, or weird. It's just like abuse, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's an abuse of power. Yeah, and it, I mean, I'll, just the list you just did, it's like there's too much to even think about sometimes, I think, much less try to um, do anything about, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, um, that's that's why my coworkers are great. Uh, mm -hmm. They think about this stuff and then tell you, okay, the most effective thing you can do here is talk to this person or read this paper or, you know, call this representative or said sign this petition so they they kind of think about this all day um i trust them <laughs> um i guess do you have an ideal internet um like what is there any like what that would look like to you um be uh, it's such a big question i think i would love a more decentralized internet where we have more control, like users have more control about our experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that we can access the open internet and that it continues to be open and available for everyone without restrictions, but that we have a little more control about what, how we interact with the world there. Um, especially people who are more vulnerable need to have a lot more control about their experience. Um, then, for example, people 
some people say, oh, the internet of the 90s, fully open, it was so great. Well, I was there and it wasn't that great. <laughs> um, because, <laughs> because if you were, you know, like not a man and not English speaking and not white and not cis, there were many, many issues with mm. the internet of the 90s that we now know. And I feel like a, a better internet will have to know all those all those things we can't just discard all the knowledge we have right but the decentralization issue um is definitely important for me i wish there was more to choose from mm -hmm. i mean i've seen you on mastodon after all which um yeah. initially seemed like it would be the new twitter and then of course you know Oh, people course. people got nervous about it and it seemed daunting i guess <laughs> i guess one thing that i didn't put in my bio is that i worked at twitter from 2010 oh. to 2014 so when it was growing okay uh when it was getting big and um yeah it was it was quite an experience to see the growth of such a gigantic thing um and also it's been very interesting to see it collapse. Um, so yeah, I I do like Mastodon. I also like Blue Sky and I hate them both for different reasons. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess like the future, I mean, also like your ideal social media, just, we like even, even people. I totally buy that people are too starry-eyed about the '90s internet. Um, yeah. Edward Snowden definitely was in his book. I'm pretty sure, but <laughs> I, it does seem like there's again sort of a mainstream liberal. Oh, we, an anonymity is dangerous. You know, it's um, right. only trolling happens with anonymity, and they want all. I mean, kind of moderation everywhere, whereas. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my thing is like you want you want the highway to be uh, neutral, but in your car, maybe you could have differing levels of moderation. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That seems yeah, exactly. sort of... <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think there's like a right answer for all of the internet, right? And it's like there's so many experiences, so many people from all nations of the world, right? Like we don't, we can't tell what a better experience is for everyone right um every once in a while we get that old chestnut of oh if people only use their real names and identities then they wouldn't troll as much i'm like well have you been to facebook <laughs> yeah. um because it's not famously a troll free environment mm -hmm. um have you been to linkedin I don't even know how to use LinkedIn. I just it makes me nervous because I feel like yeah, I don't. I, don't <laughs> I hope I never get fired because then I'll have to you know use LinkedIn <laughs> to get a job. That's or just yeah. I've never gotten any work from LinkedIn. I got I made you know more than twenty thousand dollars over my career thanks to Twitter interactions. Nice. So thanks a lot, Elon Musk, for that. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I I made more than that because they pay me a salary. Mm -hmm. Uh <laughs> but never from like actual engagement. Only yeah. from yeah. the sweat of my brow. <laughs> um I guess I don't know if I should ask you about the kids today. Um my husband <laughs> blew my mind when he told me that Gen Z and whatever the next one is, is bad. At the, they're worse at technology than I like than millennials and even sometimes worse than, you know, uh, previous generations. Like, I guess wow. I assume that's a consequence of like a walled garden corporate Internet. But I wonder if that's going to have any negative effects in terms of making a better Internet if people never learned in the first place you know yeah. i think they may be better at some things and worse at others yeah uh, i feel like newer generations have like a basic like a very good handle of what good content is like like if they have a very specific idea of how to produce content and what is engaging content and what they want to like their message how they want to put their messages out there in the world how to put themselves out of the world right 
Um, but yeah, it's possible that they're less tech heavy because they've grown with all of these tools that are just too easy to use, right? Like we've died, had to learn how to use things that were not easy. So maybe that maybe the nerd made me the nerd that I am today. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like I never was as savvy as um, I might have been. Um, but on the other hand, I used LimeWire and remember playing two different games um, via MS-DOS. So nice. I think compared to <laughs> a lot of people, <laughs> that sounds very fancy indeed. So Yeah, did you have to load them from a diskette? Not the ones I'm thinking of. I, I distinctly remember, like... It was just, it was Wolfenstein where you killed Nazis. Oh, yeah. There was one where you little alien trying to get home. And I just, I just remember nice. exiting windows and doing backslash, <laughs> etc. Very nice. So very long ago that was. Um, yeah. uh, possibly abrupt transition, but are you a transhumanist? Um, or do you have any thoughts about that? I think I am. Mm -hmm. um, in terms that I, I like, I fully believe in bodily autonomy, mm -hmm. and you know, in that we we should hack our own bodies as we see fit, right? Like if we keep finding ways to make ourselves happier through our bodies, I am fully into that and I think everybody should do whatever they want I don't give a fuck about like living forever or like <laughs> uploading my consciousness to the cloud I don't yeah. care about that I don't, I don't care <laughs> I do um that's yet another thing that I worry about the backlash um you know transphobia can also give us a nice backlash against transhumanism you know, yeah. people, do you know that surgery involves cutting your body? It's like, yes, I did know that. Yeah, people have surgery all the time. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> um, is there something that anarchists and or like more radical leftists get wrong about technology or just don't know or... Let's see. I think there's a part of the love, especially the ones that are like more leaning authoritarian that believe if only the right people had the power, then censorship shouldn't be too bad. Right now, or like spider people, it should be fine. Like, it, it, you know, there's this tendency to say, yeah, we can give all of these powers to the state if only the state was in the hands of the right people. And I mm -hmm. think that's a mistake that has been made in history, <laughs> you know? Um, and the other thing is that sometimes in the more, I guess, idealistic and activist uh, cadres, we sometimes underestimate how much money plays a role in making technology that matters and like good quality technology, the kind that becomes infrastructure in our lives. Mm. Um, it takes a lot of labor, it takes um, a lot of specialized knowledge, and it sometimes takes a lot of money just to sustain. So, you know, even the, the great software projects that we rely on need to survive. So that's that's one thing that we sometimes underestimate. Um, in terms of like, what's I just want to ask about like 4chan now, like the extremes of unmoderated Internet. I mean, a lot of people find that very alarming, but obviously mm -hmm. 4chan influenced uh it's always more and more internet culture than i realize it's always oh that came from 4chan that came from 4chan and yeah. then arguably that sort of helped give us donald trump and stuff um yeah. i mean like do you have an ideal level of moderation like it it, <laughs> it it seems like we have to decide in a sort of overly extreme way like you everything's gonna be 4chan or everything's gonna be i don't know what the perfect opposite is but uh... <laughs> um neopets <laughs> <laughs> i no. dimly remember neopets. 
No, I don't. I don't know. Um, honestly, I don't. I don't have an answer to that. It's too complicated for me. I I worry about you know the horrible garbage corners of the internet, but I also think there's horrible corners of humanity that we can't just you know ignore disappear pretend that they don't exist or legislate out of existence mm -hmm. so yeah it's a it's a tough one i mean i i hear the argument less lately but some people think that you know if something like uh stormfront or whatever exists then you kind of can see what the worst people are doing and <laughs> how they're communicating i mean i know there are other um more private things but is there like i don't know if it's it, like i again okay again again like um you know what i've heard about whatever nazi website gets pulled down again and again and i have schadenfreude about it but is there mm -hmm. any downside to removing at least the very extremes from the internet um I think for me, an important question is who's doing the removing? Mm -hmm. Because giving that power to someone has to be a very careful decision. So is the state taking that down and under what premises? Or is it a service provider taking that down? Should they be the ones to make that decision? Like, I worry that that's not as straightforward as it sounds, right? Like, who... Who is going to have the power to decide what's appropriate content to exist on the internet? And that I think it's a, it's a difficult question. I also have no straightforward answer. I mean, does it, I know it's not the state, but there's certain almost monopolistic um, exactly. corporate things. Uh, like I, I looked at Parler and Gab and they're both pretty bad, but um, I remember when all the app stores took down Parler, mm -hmm. and I don't want to hang out there, but the idea that you can't really even make a more um, almost unmoderated, like it's basically like, like that seems yeah. bad to me that you don't have, you know, I guess I want a free enterprise in, <laughs> in that way, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, you always think, okay, this is happening to you know, the Nazis because it's bad for business right now and they're taking them down because it's not good for their investors or whatever. But the moment it becomes bad for their investors to have your anarchist friends hanging out in their servers, then you're going down, right? Like it's not it's not like they're making a principal stance against Nazis, right? All yeah. those corporations are making very simple decisions about their bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of anarchist friends of non-Servium were booted off of Facebook a couple of years ago in the great terror over Antifa. Um, oh, I bet, yeah. I left Scary. Facebook a long time ago because it's terrible. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> I don't know, I keep imagining like a hypothetical liberal who thinks like EFF is like the same as, I don't know, like Elon Musk or something. Like, I feel like some of the really good, like the really good techie allies are sometimes filed with like the Silicon Valley dorks who actually don't like, you know, an open internet, like, or <laughs> yeah. like liberals who don't like Edward Snowden and stuff. Um, I don't know. There's a lot. I think, um, well, EFF has existed for 30 years, mm -hmm. right? It's pretty old. And it was very different when it was founded. It was founded by Silicon Valley people, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of them were technologists, the people who made the, the internet in the beginning or imagine what it could be. Um, and since then it has changed a lot, right? Like the people, the topics, the things they're facing, the even our staff and how we, you know, who we are and like there's, the leadership is all kinds of things so yeah the EFF tends to have an image of like a bunch of technologists very Silicon Valley based very San Francisco based mm -hmm. but in reality we have um 
we have uh, a lot of international work, a lot of um, allies all over the country, small organizations working locally in privacy and security issues, like in their communities, going you know to the local council and talking about use of surveillance and privacy for their um, small towns and in other smaller cities. So uh, you know, EFF is, is more than it's more than the <laughs> than it seems. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of work, and there's other organizations doing amazing work, um, not just EFF. But for example, one of my favorites is Lucy Parsons Labs in uh, Chicago, and they do a lot of great research into police surveillance, and mm -hmm. um, they're amazing. There's a lot more like Freedom of the Press Foundation um, doing excellent work. So, you know, there's a lot of really good, cool, good, fun organizations to get involved with, not just BFF, if it's to, to Silicon Valley, thank you for you. <laughs> I have been dying to write and I haven't been able to get like a publication to bite, but it seems like I've seen some very localized um, fights against facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. And I find that very intriguing because I wouldn't have expected it to be so localized because it feels like it, the whole point is it's an all encompassing threat. I don't know mm -hmm. if localized um, fights maybe like, I don't know. I think they matter because yeah. that's how that's how law enforcement happens in the yeah. ground, right? It's like the local police department, do they have authorization to use those cameras everywhere or do they not, right? Like local shops are giving them their surveillance footage or if your ring cameras are giving them direct access like yeah. to your neighborhood visuals, right? Like, so so I think the local, the local level matters a lot. Mm -hmm. um. If you can abolish like one, my example is, I'm going to cite my husband um, who wishes he could work for EFF, <laughs> website stuff. Um, he thinks the third party doctrine, if you got rid of that, then we would live in a magical paradise. I don't know <laughs> if there's something along those lines that if you got rid of it, there would be a really substantial improvement. <laughs> I think all of these data brokers that sell your information okay. mm -hmm. uh, from like, for example, advertise like to advertisers or from one website to the other, or from one tech company to the other, there's a, there's a lot of intermediaries there that are like shady and not super public. And they do a lot of like shady dealings with your information and your identity. And I think getting rid of data brokers is one of those like magic wishes. Okay. Um, actually, that, that makes me want to ask you, uh, some of the movements towards owning your own data sounds positive, but to me, it always sounds like an intellectual property endorsing Ooh. thing. I don't know if, I don't know how quite how that would work, I guess, but I think it's an yeah. interesting idea. I think the implementation is tricky, but I think it has to do with what we were just saying about um, having a lot of control about your experience of of your experience. It's not so much yeah. like you own your data, like it's you know your property and you shouldn't touch it without paying me, because that's a terrible incentive. <laughs> it's more like no, I don't want you to access all of these aspects of my life, mm -hmm. right? Like unless I give you express permission. So I think in that sense, it's more, um, it's more imaginable that we could get to that. Like you can own your data in the sense that you can give it away with consent, but not you own it like, oh, this is an asset you can sell now. Uh, yeah. Um. I guess I'm, gonna, I'm trying to move into your anarchist plant shop, but first, I still, <laughs> um, I guess back to social media. Um, you know the thing they say where if you if you don't pay, um, you're the product. Um, mm -hmm. And now, of course, there's occasional threats that Elon Musk wants people to pay for terrible Twitter, like it's being ruined, well monetized. Yeah. 
I don't know. Like, is there? I was just wondering if social media is like fundamentally, unless you have people keeping the servers open for the love, like you're not really. It doesn't seem sustainable in some ways, even if people love it and they're addicted to it. Especially yeah. with social media. It's something that's very expensive to do. Uh, mm. It's one of those things that require a chunk of money. And even giant companies with all the like, more money than God can't get it together, right? They can't have the right moderation. They can't do the right thing. So mm. it's not easy. It's, it's really hard. And what we're seeing, for example, with Mastodon is an experiment on how to distribute that that costs right like and you have to distribute that cost across the user base or you know there has to be something that you can do to sustain this infrastructure uh, as a collaboration and not burden uh, someone you know not demand someone sacrifice for the cause right <laughs> um so yeah i think uh, it Mastodon is an experiment in that, right? Like, can can we make this sustainable? And I don't know if we know yet. Mm. We'll, we'll see. Um, I suppose I'm trying to decide when I might have been willing to pay for Twitter. Like, what year it was good enough? Um, but obviously now, <laughs> never. Well, ever. It, was, it was always advertising. I mean, almost always. For a long time, it was advertising. Uh, you were paying for it with your eyeballs on right. advertising. So that was that was it. And with your content, of course, right? Like yeah. every time you put like a beautiful picture of your cat, there's content, right? Like that you're paying for it. Yeah, we certainly are. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes, I don't... Anarchist plant shop, question mark? <laughs> Uh, this was a fun project that I had a few years ago. I love plants. I love mm -hmm. houseplants. Um, and I, this started as a joke as in like, if you they never had to work under capitalism, what would you do? And I always said, I would have a plant shop. Like I would have an anarchist plant shop that doesn't make one sense. And mm -hmm. still, you know, like give people little plants and you know where I can have conversations with people who come by and have tea and give them some zines so that's what I did I said maybe I don't like the utopian future will never come I have to do this now so I found a spot in um, a friend's house that has like a little storefront and I opened the plant shop for one day. I put a lot of art in, um, a lot of I printed a lot of zines. My mother helped me. It was great. She loved the zine um, against the police. It was fantastic. Anyway, um, I did a lot of art. I did a lot of literature. I opened for one, for one day. People came over. And they took the little things. We talked about politics. We talked about plants. We had tea, we had food, it was lovely. And then I closed. Um, so that was one day. I, I did it later in San Francisco at uh, Noise Bridge, the mm -hmm. um, hacker space. And we did the same thing, a few friends. We grabbed a few plants um, and cuttings and people brought cuttings. And in the end, it was like a plant swap. Mm -hmm. And we had zines, we had art. Um, we talked a lot about the noise bridge. It was great. I think what I like the most about it is that it's a good experiment on people like maybe not usually coming to anarchist spaces, coming by because they like, they're curious about plants and they like mm -hmm. plants. Everybody likes plants. Um, and then also, it was a weird mix of anarchists coming in, not knowing anything about plants and learning how to take care of something that's alive. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was fun too. Um, 
but also I learned that a lot of people wanted to give me money for plants. And I insisted that no, that the whole thing is that <laughs> it's, you know, you can't take things for free. Like people with money should take to learn how to take things for free because then people who have no money can, you know, can do that freely too, right? Like it's, it's, it's really a weird idea that we don't know how to accept free things if we yeah, have money. That's, I think that's true. Um, what if someone wanted to pay you in like zines or muffins or something? Is that allowed or is it just free? They, if they, <laughs> can, leave, they can leave their muffins on the <laughs> table. Someone will eat them. That's for sure. Yeah. A lot of people brought donuts for some reason. Good mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was in favor. That's good. Um, that makes me want to ask you about solar punk because I learned about that through an interview. Do you know what solar punk is? Yeah. Do you have any, just because you're loving plants and technology, I like the idea of something that could actually, like a world that would actually mix. So it's not Luddite or it's not the apocalypse. But um, Exactly. <laughs> It's a world where we, you know, use technology to make ourselves happier and healthier and more, you know, yeah, more free. It and sounds almost, great. And we have trees too. Um, yeah. I almost want to, yeah, I, if I, I just want to ask you about Costa Rica too. Do they, <laughs> do they not have an army technically in Costa Rica still? Yeah, it's a funny story. Um, we, like many Latin American countries in the 40s, there was a growing socialist slash communist um, faction in the, in the government who was relatively close to getting power. In fact, we had a couple, uh, at least one president who uh, did like labor rights and the and socialized medicine, right? And instituted that kind of thing. But of course the Americans couldn't have it. So they supported a coup. Um, and our guy who was like, maybe a right wing center, right wing, um, did a coup to cover the government and in order to prevent the counter coup, dissolved the army. Wow. So it was a radical step <laughs> and it ended up being a good thing, but it was initially an anti-communist move. I didn't realize that. Um, and I even, there's so many America doing stuff in Latin America stories that I hadn't even gotten to Costa Rica because there are so many. It is you a know. tiny one. Yeah. <laughs> it was a tiny and relatively benign one. So it's mm. okay. Ended um, up being a good thing. So how's it going without an army? Sounds great. <laughs> can I come? It's fine. Yeah, you can come visit. It's great. Um, I mean, there was always the thing about, you know, you, you were allowed not to have an army because you will always have the United States backing mm. you for being anti-communist. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I hear rumors that you're also writing a novel. Is this true? <laughs> yes, it's been like a year and a half and but I've been working on it for longer, honestly. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty good. I think it's in good shape. That's good. Do you, have you written fiction um, before? I have, yeah. I've always been more of a fiction writer. Um, yeah, in my, in my life in Costa Rica before moving to the U.S., I was, I was more of a writer than a, than anything else. I used to write a blog that was pretty popular and I wrote poetry and a lot of other things and now finally I have some bandwidth to publish a novel so I'm excited about it. Does anything um, political or technological ever happen in your fiction? That's just... It does, yeah. I have um, my character uh, it's a it's a person who works in tech, right? Like she works in tech, and the whole thing is that she she's very autistic, I have to say. Um, but she thinks that she can um, 
kind of get some sort of predictions from data about things and tragedies that are going to happen. But of course, she can never predict the things that are going to happen to her. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what it's about. Um, I was going to ask you for uh, media recommendations, but now, of course, I want to ask you about uh, sci-fi or speculative fiction. Do you have do you have oh. favorites? Uh, Drop some names or titles. Well, I read a lot of words like Haley Wim, as I as I mentioned before. I do love it. I I read a lot of science fiction. I am a fan of the Expanse series, mm -hmm. which is pretty fun, and I call it like the space cooperative. It's I love it. I've seen it like six times. Uh, the series, and mm -hmm. then um, yeah, I like. Uh, I love uh, Martha Wells' uh, series. Um, what's it called? It's slipping my mind. I know I've seen that name. Yeah. Um, Is that the murder bot? Murder bot. Yeah, love it. Love that series. It's fantastic. Yeah, I've been. I haven't. Um checked it out but i keep seeing it and it, 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 i'm always been vaguely intrigued so yeah um, it's really fun is there any uh like sci-fi of old that you like um i don't know i i mean i was uh always a i mean between Star Trek and Star Wars fan. I was always more of a Star Trek mm. fan. Um, I thought it was really fun. DS9 is my favorite. Okay. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I like a lot of things. I also like, I also, of course, watch a lot of things that are in Spanish and from Latin America. Um, and I'm lately into movies. I've there's a couple that I think um, that are newer movies that I that dubbed or translated to English that people should watch. One is Mexican, it's called Roma. Mm -hmm. It's from 2018, it's really beautiful. And then um, there's a Chilean one that is called A Fantastic Woman. Mm -hmm. um, it is also really beautiful. So yeah, those are some, some that I've seen lately that I really like. I have found that um, watching, it was Jurassic Park and Independence Day, because I've seen them five million times dubbed in Spanish, <laughs> makes me feel like I can understand Spanish more, so. Yeah, that's good, that's good practice. Um, okay, so we, all, we always like to ask, um, how would I get a cappuccino in your political utopia? <laughs> uh, I don't have a political utopia. You would have to get a cappuccino in this world we live in, which, <laughs> you know, where I am sitting is two blocks away. There's a co-op, mm. a little like queer co-op place that makes amazing cappuccinos. So there you have it. No need to <laughs> completely change the world. You can just I like walk that down answer. there and have it. Yeah. That's a good one. And not just because... Well, I've been to Guatemala and Belize, um, and the best coffee I've had in my life was, of course, fresh in Guatemala. So mm, nice. <laughs> yeah. um, before I tell you to where the people ask where the people can find you on the internet, um, and if you want to take time, that's we can. It's fine. Um, can you give me specifically three media recommendations, kind of? you know, techy or just like things that you recommend to kind of get for people to get a better sense of you and what you know, if that makes sense? <laughs> well, I think um, the one recent book I read uh, is Kashmir Hill, uh, Your Face Belong to Us. I was just looking and, at that. 
in Barnes & Noble yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, really good. And it is an excellent example of like the kinds of things that are possible and how they come to be and how they are so intertwined with the political environment, uh, tech and politics being extremely close. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say there's, there's the um, EFF podcast called How to Fix the Internet. I recommend that one. It's pretty fun. We have guests that are people who are really cool, and I I like that a lot. Um, and what else? Um, yeah, I think I don't know if I have a third one. <laughs> um, instead, you could tell me what your favorite bird is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your top, I, why did I ask you about your top three birds? I mean, that would have been my, yeah, like that would be easy. <laughs> um, but um, I think my favorite bird is a species of toucan that is very small, mm. and that is local here in my city. So it it is very funny because it's a small bird with a gigantic beak, um, and I kind of love that. I saw some little toucan guys. I was like, it was called trip to Belize and they would feed them watermelon in the mornings and they were little toucans and they were so delightful. They are wonderful. Um, all right. Well, if that's, I mean, if that's your bird, that's, that's a fine bird. Um, <laughs> well, where can the people on the internet find you? Um, I am Lena Zoon on blue sky. Um, in I am LCG at Mastodon Social. That's why I thought your last name was Zoon initially, which yeah. seemed like a good last name. Oh, so you yeah, <laughs> um, it's actually like it's because I have so I have many last names. So my Spanish last name is Zuniga, so it starts with Z. And my English last name is gone, so it's, yeah. Okay. It's <laughs> always good to know. Um, yeah. Um, as usual, people can find Non-Servium on Twitter, Non-Servium Media, all one word. Um, we're also on Mastodon and Blue Sky. Um, I'm also on there individually. Um, so you could find me if you wanted. 